This evening's presentation is going to be done by Keith McLaughlin, TV Securities uh, and Small Caps. In fact, that's where we'll be billing him from this evening. Hi guys, um, this is a bit of a learning curve, so give me give me a moment to adjust to it. Uh, it's a very new format, a very new media. Um, but without further ado, this is uh, basics of fundamentals. Uh, the definitions of fundamentals. I, I went. I went around and I had a look at a couple. Went around and had a look at a couple of uh, uh, definitions. One of them is an Oxford Dictionary, affecting or relating to the essential nature of something of a crucial point about an issue. Um, um, Standard Bank, uh, online share trading actually has a very good glossary in it. It includes uh, information on stock performing to business, to the business of a company and how it relates to earnings and dividends. I, I want to underline earnings and dividends, how it relates to that. Investopedia also uh, defines fundamentals as the qualitative and quantitative. That's worth a thought. Qualitative or quantitative information that contributes to the economic well-being and subsequent financial valuation of a company's security or currency. Uh, so just having a look back, uh, Oxford Dictionary essentially says um, that it's, it's the essence of something. You have a look at Standard Bank, you can see uh, they're talking about dividends, they're talking about earnings, and the media talks about qualitative and quantitative. In essence, in essence, fundamentals is finding out the true value of an asset. And in this case, we're talking specifically about equity, uh, and we want to work out, we want to uh, be able to, by the end of this course, understand the fundamentals of a company in, in order to calculate the value, the true value of the share, which often, which often differs from its share size. Just having, having a look at this graph, it, it illustrates a view that I have where uh, fundamentals are essentially a, a foundation. A fundamentals are essentially a foundation of the market valuations. The um, day-to-day fluctuations are a lot of the stuff in the press and in the media. Uh, you hear of uh, volatility, uh, openings, closes, you know, futures, uh, close-outs. Everything uh, influences the daily, even the minutely, secondly price of, of, of shares. But it's, it's the fundamentals that they're always essentially snap back to. Uh, fundamentals being a foundation of all valuations in the market and the aggregation of all of them. Um, in essence, the short-term volatility is actually subject to the long-term, um, uh, long-term fair values of the assets. We, we have a... There's, there's a principle we talk about mean reversion. Um, ignore, uh, from a fundamental perspective, because fundamentals tend not to change uh, from moment to moment, albeit uh, J Japan is an example of how they can. Uh, but uh, getting back to fundamentals tend to be a longer term view. So the short term noise in the market and, and, and fluctuations around it are actually used as uh, entry or exit opportunities. They're not viewed as meaningful in themselves. Are there any in insofar as um, they they provide you either a ability to buy an asset cheaper than it is or sell an asset for um, more than it's worth. I have uh, in when it's talking specifically to uh, around equities, I have what I call the four pillars. There is a fifth pillar, and that's the macroeconomic environment. This course uh, that that's actually worth bring up in another course, and perhaps I will go into that, uh, but specific to a company, you need to look at uh, asset-specific risk as opposed to system, uh, uh, system risk or systematic risk, which is the macro environment. So the four pillars of a, of a company are simply profitability, liquidity, solvency, and management. Looking at the first one is that it's the overarching aim of a business. It's got to make profit. If there's no profit, there's no business. Uh, and I'm not saying there's no profit now, there's no business. There may be profit in the future. Well, the essential point is that there is profit. And in, in the entire life cycle of a business, from beginning, growing, uh, maturity, even to winding down, it should have, there should be more uh, outputs than there are inputs. And that's, that is on a very basic level. That's, that's what profit is. 
Next pillar is liquidity. There's there's, there's a interesting um, view of business where it doesn't matter what your profit is. It doesn't matter what your accounting uh, profit, what your book is. Um, if the cash coming into your bank account every single day is more than the cash going out of it, you're always in business. And that, that's the essence of liquidity. Uh, you can have the most amazing business plan, great management in place, but if you can't make your day-to-day -day payments and you, you don't have the ability to be liquid, uh, or and, as I wrote there, bankroll the day-to-day -day operations, it's simple, you will go out of business. Um, Warren is a good example right now where they had to settle with the creditors, but they brought in a lot of debt. And that brings me to the second point where you have solvency. Um, solvency is, in essence, it's a longer-term view of liquidity. You, you get, uh, whereas you get day-to-day -day creditors and you have, to, you have to settle accounts as they arise, solvency it tends, tends to uh, work into your financing structure. So you'll look at your debt to equity ratios, you, you'll look at your uh, repayment schedules for financing, um, and if, if, if at any point on paper you get, to the, you get to where your debt is greater than, um, it, it, well actually a, a better way of phrasing is that your equity is n negative, um, then you have more debt than you have assets. So you're insolvent. So it's critical to manage from a longer term perspective. Bear in mind, fundamentals are longer term. Um, critical to understand that solvency aspect. In a way, short term liquidity problems will become long term solvency problems because often guys, guys will move, you know, they, they're running a business based on uh, overdraft. So they have a negative working capital or they have, they have a terrible working capital cycle and it's getting worse and worse because they, they're paying more uh, to the creditors and to the employees and various uh, operational expenses than they're bringing in. Um, then, so their debtors are, tend to be accumulating whereas the creditors tend to be very low and they, and they probably have an overinvestment in, the, in inventory. A lot of guys in the short term can finance that in overdraft. In the long term, overdraft is very expensive. So you see how liquidity constraint will move to a solvency constraint when uh, the guy takes the overdraft and converts it to maybe a longer term loan. It hasn't solved the problem. The problem is actually uh, is, is sitting in management. Uh, they, they're mismanaging the business, and, but you can look at that, uh, that leverage, the risk, uh, the longer term risk uh, in, in the solvency um, ratios. That actually uh, brings me to the point of my final pillar, I talk about management. Management, it, it's simple. Management are the guys who make the decisions. Be they at board level or be they below. Uh, it's, it's often hard to judge the guys at operational levels. You don't always have access to them. But even with the board, you have limited access. There, there's various different ways you can judge uh, the quality of management. The reason management is important, though, is because they're the custodians of capital. Um, they are the guys who make the decisions where you, a company does a terrible acquisition, brings on a huge amount of debt. We use uh, Warren as, as an example. Uh, where they, bought, they bought a quarry at the peak of the, uh, peak of the bull market, paying a huge amount for it, and they, and they incurred a large amount of debt to bring that onto their books. Uh, quarry proceeded to make a lot of uh, terrible losses, and they were highly leveraged. Um, so their liquidity, their solvency ratios were all impacted and that trickled down obviously to profits. Uh, the profitability took a huge whack because cash flows and cash flows and accounting profits in, in the long run match each other. It should theoretically match each other perfectly. So management is the but no, none of the shareholders, nobody drove anybody to do anything. Management chose to buy their quarry. And it, it's these impacts of major decisions that management can make or break a company on. Even from a day-to-day -day basis, management creates the, the culture of control, the culture of quality, the culture of profitability, consciousness of uh, costs. Um, and in essence, you can have the best business model, but management is responsible for the execution of that business model. And that's, that's a very important part. They, they are custodians of capital, and they execute the business model. It's the quality of execution that's very important. So those, those are the four pillars of, of fundamentals. And the way I see, obviously there's a macro, uh, there's a macro angle where you have things like forex interest rate, uh, 
forex uh, interventions, you have interest rates, you have tax tax regimes, international international concerns, geopolitical events like we're seeing across Africa, you know, acts of God like we're seeing in uh, Japan. These these all impact uh, the macro, which is another aspect of fundamentals. But I've decided to zoom in here directly into the equity equity markets fundamentals. And in that aspect, there's the four pillars: profitability, liquidity, solvency, and management. These are, if you can see the bigger picture, are the inputs into your valuation process. The valuation process being the core, where you you extrapolate uh, forward revenues. You you try you use different models. You look at cash flows. You ex and the essence is looking at using your inputs, using your understanding of the fundamentals, to to value the business. And evaluation is always based on the future. It's always it's historical is historical trends can be used um, as as a basis or as a yardstick, but but it you know the weight is always to the future. So your fundamentals are your inputs into the valuation process, and the valuation process it will uh, it will take you it will take you to the decision making process. It's, it's that simple. Um, you achieve your fair value. Your fair value moving in, into the future is essentially your target price. You know, you can do 12 month target price. You can do one year, uh, five year, 10 year target prices. It doesn't matter what your uh, investment horizon is. It allows you to extrapolate the, un, uh, the, uh, the unwinding or the incremental growth in fair value into the future. And um, your understanding of all these inputs and valuation process will, will you will build an instinct uh, of the risk to return ratio. You can even uh, calculate it. Sensitivity analysis, a good example of sensitivity analysis being gold mine. You can value a gold mine right now based on spot. But what will it be in five years' time? And it's very dependent on uh, gold, uh, what, what the gold price does, you know, what, the, what the RAND dollar exchange does if it's a South African mine. So sensitivity analysis is a form of risk return uh, uh, analysis where you, you, you mess around with these inputs, the variables, in, into the model that are outside of management control. Bear in mind, a lot of these fundamentals are in management control. Some of them are out. And those, those, that's the outside of management control's um, variables you use for sensitivity analysis to show the risk and return. Um, and you come up with only one of three decisions, buy, sell, or hold. In essence, that is fundamentals. That is equity fundamentals. How you go from looking at looking at a benchmark of each each of the four uh, of four pillars, doing a valuation process, and arriving at a decision. So, in conclusion, fundamentals are, and this is this is more my definition than anything else. Fundamentals are the quantitative and qualitative inf uh, elements influencing future profits and cash flows particularly influencing the profitability, the liquidity, the solvency, and the management. Um, and you arrive at, at a bar, sell, or hold decision for an equity instrument. That, that in essence, is um, fundamentals. Now, this course, we're going to work our way through. We've started with an overarching understanding of where fundamentals fit into the investment process. It's, it's a longer-term uh, Longer term understanding, you're trying to cut out noise, you're trying to find true value. Um, as, as they say in X Files or Fox Mulder, you know, the truth is out there. You, you, have, to, you have to work your way through a range of data sources, a range of, of mediums, uh, information streams. You, you have to do a lot of original research, and actually, a lot of it will turn out to be noise. But you don't know that until you've gone through it. To arrive at at the truth, and the truth is is what exactly that value of that business is. Once you've got that yardstick, you can make your decision, um, and where the share price is uh, is actually secondary to that. So, and, and that's uh, in in conclusion, that's that, that's really where I was going. So, the fundamentals, the foundation of the long term market valuations and fair value, um, and you have to use them as inputs into your decision making process. So guys, that that's that's uh, in a nutshell is really the um it's almost like a content of the course we're gonna go into. We're gonna go into each one of the pillars in detail. We're gonna start going into uh, valuation processes, more simple and work our way into the more complex. 
Um, th there will be a point of bringing macroeconomics as well because uh, companies always become sensitive to changes in interest rates and market rates and, and you need to understand where the asset classes lie. But in essence, this, this is, that's, that's the contents of the course, uh, the way we're going to be working our way through it. And um, now's a good time to ask for any questions. Uh, so when I can see your question there, I'll come to you in just a second while we take some others. Um, just to launch a poll as well, for just for something to do. Uh, Keith Safina is asking, um, how does one incorporate the fundamentals of a company into trading short term? Well, remember the fundamentals, you're coming up with a, with a value. You're coming up with the truth of exactly what that business is worth, the equity of that business. So from a training perspective, although personally I'm a longer term view, um, yeah, I need, I need to uh, sort of put this disclaimer out there. I don't, I don't trade, I take, take longer term investments. But if you were to use the fundamentals as a, as a basis to trade, you would arrive at your true value, intrinsic value of the company, and you could trade around it. I.e. When, when the intraday fluctuations drop below, you know, below the fair value, you can go long, and when they go above the fair value, you can go short in essence. Obviously, you have to bear in mind that you have a look at the, the previous slide on uh, Anglo-American. You can see from uh, around 2004 to 2005, it was trading below the fair value. It, uh, you know, companies can trade for extended purposes, below, uh, uh, extended periods below the fair value, but it does, uh, you know, offer you, it does offer you a benchmark against which to trade. Um, I, I hope this has this helped to answer your question. Uh, so, when I see you put through a text question, if you want to ask a follow-up, then raise your hand again and I'll turn on your mic. Uh, someone's asking, um, how is the growth in peg ratio determined and how does management influence it? That's, that's a... There's not a simple answer to that question, so I'll, but I'll try to keep it, keep it in a, a nutshell. You see, we need to distinguish between historical ratios and the forward ratios. A peg ratio, in a historical basis, you can calculate it down to a T. It's how much a company is growing, be it on top line growth, bottom line growth, share of holder growth, and, you know, the price earnings divided by that. So you can calculate that to a T. But historical is not always an indication of future uh, or forward ratios. So on a forward ratio, um, it's, it, 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 becomes, it becomes harder to, because you, you're working with a, uh, um, an element of error. There's, there's always judgment involved. So it, how the fundamentals come down, you know, obviously the more stable the fundamentals are, the, with more accuracy, more, at least, I shouldn't say accuracy, with more confidence, you can start to forecast forward future, uh, future growth rates. Um, and more volatile they are, the harder it becomes. So management, management as, uh, as almost the custodian of all the other uh, fundamental variables, if they're running a business well, they should, they should always be forward-looking, uh, and they should be able to, to, to a large extent, actually, uh, strip out a lot of the volatility of the business, uh, allowing you to um, you know, greater confidence in uh, forward forecasting. That said, that there are different industries and different risk profiles, like a man not have the same ability to, to manage that, that uh, forward risk as, uh, for example, an you know, IT company where maybe 100% of their revenues are annuity-based. Um, that also leads me to you talking about growth rates. There, there's short-term, medium-term, long-term, and terminal growth rates. So it, it also depends on what time, time period you're looking at the peg ratio on. You see, a, a one year forward, well, as, as a rule of thumb, the fundamentals when you're forecasting things, it, the further forward you look, the greater the margin of error is. It's, it, it's risky to forecast a company. It's hard to forecast a company's one year earnings. It's near impossible to forecast their 10 year earnings. But um, the long-term growth rate is probably the single most important factor in any company. If you get the, because you, this may be jumping drastically, right, almost to the end of our presentations, but in the discounted cash flow, which is a valuation model, depending on what years or periods in the future you take it, you, 
your terminal year, which is the year that your company matures and continues to chug along at, at a finite growth, a growth rate, that year often weighs anywhere from half to 75% of the fair value of the company. You get that year right, you get the valuation right. You get the year wrong, you'll be, you'll be, you know, you, your, obviously your, your fair value won't, won't be all that accurate. So short, short term growth rates are easier to forecast because they're, um, you're looking at less variables. Longer term ones uh, can get more complicated, and obviously the term one is the, is, the, is the critical one. It all depends on what your time horizon is for the investment, because then you want to start matching your growth rate to your time horizon to, to arrive at the same peg ratio. Um, and it also, it, 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 management plays in this as an overarching factor, where they can fundamentally change things by doing a horrible acquisition, doing great, or just continue to execute their roles perfectly. Um, in a way, management is the qualitative risk of the business. Uh, two questions I'm going to merge in. We've got uh, Zafin asking particularly about Capital Tech, um, thoughts on the fundamentals and overvalued, um, and Bavesh asking on whether you think the market is generally fundamentally overvalued at present. Okay, let's start not with Capitec. <laughs> um, the market, you see, it also depends which level you look at the market. Um, the, the, uh, there's different, the, the top 40, for example, would take, take into account huge liquidity premiums and will tend to be traded. And as you work your way down to the mid and smaller caps, those companies will tend to be under-investigated, uh, under-researched, and undervalued, and so they, they'll tend to sit with um, a way out of line. In essence, the question, if I, if I understand the question correctly, you're actually asking me about market efficiency. And in my, in my experience, in my opinion, and actually I wouldn't have a job as an analyst if the market was efficient. So, uh, I do not find the market efficient. And short-term short volatility is a good example. Uh, looking back at that angular graph, uh, there's a reason it never trades. You know, a company will very rarely actually trade in line with its fair value. Um, the question, uh, talk, talking around Capitec, Capitec has, has, has some complicated fundamentals in it. Well, first of all, management's proven its, uh, its record. You know, you, and uh, of course, a bank, when you're looking at banks, and particularly when you look at the micro loans and loan segment, the liquidity and solvency ratios are actually almost more important than the profitability ratios. Because that's, that's where you'll have shortcomings, you'll have bad debt suddenly appear if you've done it wrong, and because banks, the, the model, the financial model, is so geared that if, if, you, if you're not careful and you don't manage that structure properly, be it day-to-day -day structure or year-to-year -year structure, liquidity to solvency, you'll be in, you, you, you know, it's, it's very quick, it's amazing how quickly that can unwind and you can, you can be caught short. So I know I haven't answered your question, but I would prefer to focus on the theory side. Um, but in Capitec's case, management's proven, proven their track record. They, they have built the business well. What I would, what I would focus on yeah, fundamentally is the liquidity and solvency ratios within that bank, particularly the bad debt ratios. Everyone knows I like Capitec lots. That said, uh, 170 to me is a big price. I'm going to merge uh, three questions into one, and we'll make that the last uh, from Musa, from Sean, and from Mark. And it will be asking Keith, I mean, Mark's saying, how do you decide which valuation models? Sean's saying, how do you find fair value? And Musa's saying, how are you deciding? So, and I suppose this is what we're going to run through in the following courses, but as a step back, as someone starting, which, which roads do you go down? Is it discount bottles? Is it Gordon? Is it, is it, I mean, where does one start to decide? Well, as a basis, the more valuation models you use, the, uh, and obviously the closer the, the different answers come together, the, with more confidence you can start to say that that really is the fair value. Um, that said, it depends what investment and how you're approaching it. For example, if you're building a pension fund and you want to start to start to build, uh, you know, dividend yielding assets, obviously you'll give greater weight to to the dividend model and dividend approach of valuing a business. And then, um, if if you're looking, if you're a venture capitalist, 
you know, the dividends are the last thing on your mind. You're looking at growth rates. You're looking at you're looking at um, capital growth, really. So you start to look at a, you know discounted cash flows, particularly in an early stage business where where you actually have no track records of, of earnings. You know, a, a good medium is actually the price earnings model, where the guys, you know, you have a stable business. You, it's fairly mature, but it is growing, um, and you and but it, it, it's, it's retaining a large portion of its profits to, um, to, to reinvest because it has a superior growth rate. And, but that said, it is a, a reasonably mature business, so it's starting to pay dividends. In that case, you know, the price earnings model uh, will, will actually work very quick, very nicely as a quick approach. Um, you, can, you can start playing around with peg ratios. And then, obviously, if you have more time, expand into the DCF and, and, and uh, dividend discount models. Um, so... The best approach is all of them. The, the quickest approach and the most efficient approach is what type of business it is and why you are approaching, or what, what your aspect of approaching that investment is, be it cash flows, you know, dividend basis, or um, be it capital growth. I, I think I've answered all the questions there. We'll leave it there. Um, as Keith has said, this is going to be a, a series that could go on perhaps forever, but certainly for a little while longer. The next presentation from Keith is on the 11th of May. Bookings are open. You're welcome to attend that. Um, my thanks to Keith McLaughlin from, uh, you find him at smallcaps.co.za. And uh, my sincere thanks to all of you for attending this evening.